Tēnā koutou katoa, atamarie, no mai, harumai, and welcome to this morning's online hui held by PANS in partnership with Auckland Live. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm going to begin today with a karakia to start off our session. Me karakia tato. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro. Tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai, te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa. Haumie, huie, tai. Ai, ki e. Kia ora anō and welcome. Ko Delina wihi peihana, tōku ingoa, e uri aho nō Ngāti Raukawa me Ngāti Tukorehe. It's really fantastic to be here with you all again today, and I hope you're keeping safe and well inside your level three bubbles. I'm beaming in from my temporary office setup again here in my shed in Mount Eden in Tamaki Makoto, and really excited to be joined this morning by panelists from Ngā Hoe Fa. We've got panelists beaming in from Dunedin, the Waikato and Te Tai Tukuro, Northland. So we all know that this afternoon we'll be having an update from the government as to whether we may be moving to level two or when we will be. This is going to enable our industry to have gatherings of up to 100 and provide some new opportunities for all of us. How are our region's artists and arts practitioners going? Today, we're really pleased to be able to hear directly from practitioners and artists in our regions. We'll be joined by playwright, director, and dramaturg Emily Duncan from Dunedin, composer and CEO of Creative Waikato, Jeremy Mayle, and Kava artist, designer, and the chair of Toi Ngāpuhi, Bernard Makawari. We'd also really love to hear from you out there, especially any of you in the regions who have specific questions you'd like us to ask our panelists. Just comment in the Facebook Live or YouTube comments and we've got a team behind the scenes here, Heather, Louise and Helena, who will be collating all the questions which I can feed through to our panelists. So really excited to have you all here this morning and without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist for this morning, Emily Duncan from Dunedin. Emily is a Dunedin raised and based playwright, dramaturg and director. And she held the 2019 University of Otago Robert Burns Fellowship. She's the co-founder with producer HJ Kilkelly of Prospect Park Productions, the home of Otipoti Writers Lab and Otipoti Theatre Lab. Emily has won numerous awards for her writing, including Play Markets Plays for the Young and the Robert Lord Outstanding Script Award. She has twice been shortlisted for the Adam New Zealand Play Award as well. Emily holds a PhD in theatre. She trained at the Lee Strasberg Theatre and Film Institute in New York City and has been dramaturg for a variety of projects over the past few years. Really warm welcome to you, Emily. Kia ora. Kia ora, Morena. Thanks, Lena. Thanks for um, including uh, Otipoti in your regional lineup. So right now I'm sitting in my kitchen in my house in Northeast Valley in Dunedin. Uh, the deeper south is behind me and the north is in front of me. It is a beautiful, crisp autumn morning. Now this who is taking place uh, at quite a pertinent time for us is last Thursday, I spoke at the DCC annual plan hearings on behalf of Prospect Park Productions with the view that as we await the final report and recommendations from the Charcoal Blue Performing Arts Feasibility Study, there can be actions that can be implemented in the near future to serve practitioners audience in the wider community in Aotearoa, Dunedin. Dunedin Fringe Festival director Gareth McMillan, who spoke later in the day, um, summed it up really well as to where we are in Dunedin with, quote, we are close to a tipping point, which will leave us with dedicated amateurs in receiving touring productions from larger centres, and that the lack of a fit-for-purpose mid-sized performing arts venue is crippling for the local industry. This is definitely not one factor, but currently for Prospect Park, so much of our production budgets goes to venue costs. On the one hand, it's exciting to stage work in alternative venues, on the other, the cost is prohibitive and you're always working from a place of having to bring in much of your own infrastructure and ensure that you have the right people on your team to take care of technical requirements. Fortunately, in a town the size of Dunedin, most techs know each other or have worked together at some point. Which brings me to the point of some really world-class practitioners we have here who do not get their due. At present, specialised roles are stretched, 
which is different from exercising transferable, adapt, adaptable and, and innovative skills. Furthermore, we risk losing crucial industry knowledge in the current setting due to lack of resources and infrastructure. And I should add the pressure put on audience having to follow productions to various venues with which they may not be familiar or feel are accessible to them. So where was Prospect Park at the point of lockdown? Well, we were about to launch Playground 2020 at the Regent Theatre's Clarkson Studio for the 20th anniversary of Dunedin Fringe Festival. Playground employed 18 creatives and the program comprised six works to be delivered in portfolio format with support from the Dunedin French Arts Trust, UNESCO City of Literature and Playwright Studio Scotland. On the first night of Playground, there was to be a development presentation of Julie Edwards' one woman autobiographical piece, Te Māori Mum and Me. Then each morning of the following three mornings would begin with a free breakfast reading, including said breakfast, of scripts from Dunedin, Auckland and Edinburgh, followed by lunchtime and evening performances of Thief by Kelly Hocking and Tableland by Simon Anderson. Both of these works were initially developed through the inaugural 2019 Oti Poti Theatre Lab Playwrights Programme. Now we developed OTL in direct response to the closure of the Fortune Theatre and the loss of the Studio 4x4 programme, for which I had been dramaturg for the final two years. In addition, both HJ and I are passionate about development work and saw that there was a real opportunity to strengthen, grow and leverage this space in Dunedin. One of our objectives with OTL was that there would be a life for the playwright's work beyond the program. So we were very proud and happy for those writers that they would have had a full production for their work realized in the 2020 fringe. The third 2019 OTL playwright, while not having his piece included in the playground program, was nevertheless producing his work elsewhere in the festival with support and mentoring from HJ. So that's just a snapshot of where we are. Yeah. Kia ora, Emily. Thank you so much. I mean, it's clear to see that you've got world class practitioners making work and based in Aotearoa, and also really interesting to hear again that feeling around the sense of the loss of the fortune or the loss of a venue or a hub for artists has both a, a flow on effect for both your practitioners but also to audiences. But hearing that um, you and Prospect Park Productions responded at that time by creating the Aotearoa Theatre Lab. Again, this is sort of like another opportunity. It's gonna be really interesting to hear how your community comes together to respond at this time of COVID-19. And wonderful to hear that you continue to advocate with your local council um, for all of the practitioners in your region. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank now you. I'd like to introduce our next panelist for this morning, Dr. Jeremy Mayle. Jeremy is a composer, performer and artist from Hamilton. His work is primarily in music, sound art, installation, and multimedia formats, with a focus of, on exploring his fascination and in the interrelationships between sound, time, space, the senses, and the human experience. Collaboration is the core of much of his multi-sensory work, and his projects have included work with musicians, dancers, poets, aerial silks performers, theater practitioners, scientists, perfumers, bakers, authors, sculptors, filmmakers, pyrotechnicians, lighting designers, and visual artists. And I wanted to read them all because again, it captures the breadth of all the people who are working in our industry in different forms at this time. Jeremy's also currently the CEO of Creative Waikato, which is a regional arts and development agency in the Waikato. And prior to this role, his background is as a practicing composer as well as working at the Wintech School of Media Arts as an academic and a research leader. Kia ora, Jeremy, welcome. Kia ora, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and it's a real privilege to be a part of this panel um, talking about what's going on in the region. Um, for me, where, where I'm at, I'm, I'm in Hamilton. I'm in my, my home in Hamilton East. Um, but what's going on behind me um, is a, a photo from an art installation that I uh, worked on with a number of local artists called the Mesoverse. Um, and it opened three days before lockdown and so currently sits in limbo waiting to be experienced again at some point when we can get back out into the world. Um, in terms of what's happening in the Waikato, um, I, I think there, there are certain similarities to what's happening um, throughout New Zealand. Um, the arts and cultural sector has been hit 
really, really hard, and it's going to take a, a while for things to resume the way that they were. Um, and we're still kind of uncovering the impacts of that as we we go on. But I think what's really kind of key is in the the knowledge that arts and cultural activity is vital for the well being of our community and for this sense of identity that we experience together. And so there's it's been really remarkable, I think, to see the um, depth and breadth of work that's been emerging online, um, local artists, national artists, international artists, um, sharing work and, and providing this um, way for people to uh, find solace in, in what's happening now, um, th this kind of traumatic time. Some people have been able to be really productive, some people haven't been, um, and that's kind of the nature of how this works. But we know that the arts serve to enhance the emotional and physical health of the whole order at this time of national crisis. And while there is there is scope for what happens online, um, there's so much more joy to be experienced when we can be in a room together and we can we can share and we can connect. And at Creative Waikato, we've been um, working with community funders and with the councils around what that's going to mean for the arts organizations going forward from the Waikato region, but also trying to develop resources and support for artists, for arts organizations, and for individuals to um, connect with other artists in the region, to find new ways to share their work, to kind of think about what the future may, may mean and how we can um, imagine the world as it could be. I think that while there are some things that we definitely want to get back to. Um, there's a an opportunity now to kind of reimagine our world and to reimagine our our community and the way that we do things. And um, I think that that's that's really exciting. Um, obviously, there's um, a, a great need for support, and so what we've been doing in terms of our advocacy is is trying to ensure that our artists and our the hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure of the arts um, community can can be involved in decision making and can be around to support our communities and to um, help us to tell our stories in whichever way that might um, take whether it's visual art or whether it's performing art or um, different cultural groups um, all of these things have such benefit for our communities. Um, for, for me personally, um, what's been going on um, has been quite interesting. Um, as a CEO of Creative Waikato, I've been officially in the role since February, so I sort of jumped on board and, and then um, we're working through a pandemic, which is fun. Um, and we've been doing um, live stream chats with our community, um, but also it's been a, a chance to um, explore some different things. So I've been working on um, live stream performances over the internet with musicians from around New Zealand. Um, so there's a, a multimedia performance group that I work with called Dr. Mesmer's Private Army. Um, and we've been doing shows together um, remotely via the internet. So from five separate bubbles coming together online. And luckily the music that we make is kind of ambient. And so it works through any of the audio delays and things that you may get from online communication. Um, also running a community um, creativity event. Um, so uh, prior to lockdown, we used to run this thing called Music to Make Things To, which was a, a community event at the Meteor Theatre in Hamilton, um, which would play music for two hours and people would gather together in the space and they'd be writing or they'd be drawing or painting or crafting or um, anything creative. And so we found a way to do that online as well to have a community together in one space even though they're separate um, and then there's been a, a, a project working on um, a collaborative filmmaking thing where we've had writers and actors and filmmakers and composers working together in random collaborations uh, which has resulted in 31 short films in the uh, past three or four weeks and then other than that, getting a chance to reconnect with my family and um, work on some music with my wife and my son. And that's been a real joy. Kia ora, thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear that, that from you and from many others that this the digital space 
has opened up lots of opportunities for connectivity across this line and also across this time and also new lines of investigation of creative art of how we can all come together. It's also wonderful to hear about your advocacy work within Creative Waikato and how you're finding ways to <coughs> Facebook Live, <coughs> excuse me everybody, with your community so that your artists and people in your community are able to contribute to the decisions that might be being made at a higher level that will impact them later on. That's really great to hear. Thank you, Jeremy. Now I'd like to introduce our final panelists for this morning. Very excited to welcome Bernard Makoari to the panel this morning. Bernard is an artist and a designer with a deep knowledge of traditional wood carving. His work is a reflection of his heritage, environment, and the importance he places on Fanongatanga. Bernard has had many solo exhibitions over the past 30 years and has also been a collaborator with other creatives on a wide range of enterprises, including some really significant design projects you may have seen, including Te Wao Nui at Auckland Zoo, Shed 10, the Auckland Art Gallery, and Te Oro. Bernard has been one of three Ngāti Whātua representatives to the Auckland Museum Taumata A Iwi and also a member of the Auckland Arts Gallery Advisory Committee. Bernard is personally committed to the fields of tribal and cultural revitalization and has spent over 30 years working on this for Tirunanga o Ngāti Whātua, Ngāpuhi Te Rarawa and other iwi organisations. And Bernard is the founding chair of Toi Ngāpuhi, which is an advocacy and support agency working across Te Tai Tokoro. Good morning, Bernard. Hi, tēnā koe. Uh, Tuatahi e, e Dalina e mihi ana ki a koe. Uh, tō, tō tuku atu, tō tō pai atu i te karakia hei timatanga mō tātou. Uh, o ti rā ki a koe tau, uh, mai te tai whakarunga ki a o te poti, uh, ki a koe hoki i roto i te riu o Waikato e Jeremy, tēnā hoki koe. Uh, Aotira, uh, ki a koutou e ngā kai hāpai uh, e whakatina nei nei i tēnei kōrero te amorangi ki mua, ko, ko mātou tēnei, uh, ko te hāpai o ki muri, uh, nō reira kā mihi ki a rātou e ngā ringa ringa e āwhina tia nei ki te kaupapa tēnā koutou. Um, I'd like to thank... Uh, um, the invitation, I suppose, to, to be a part of uh, this panel this morning. And um, I had to keep reminding myself to um, that I had something to say and not get caught listening to Emily and, and Jeremy. Um, uh, and I'm really pleased to be able to do that. I suppose one of the things about uh, being a little isolated in this situation, um, my world has been uh, my home, which is uh, a little valley between the Kaipara Harbour and the Hokianga Harbour, a little valley called the Kaihu Valley, um, not very far from uh, the Waipo Forest and uh, my relatives of Te Roroa and um, Tane Mahuta and uh, uh, the, those great big Kauri trees who have been suffering a similar kind of uh, uh, epidemic uh, in the Kauri dieback that, um, that we're now experiencing as people on the face of the earth, but within that environment, that's interesting to me. Uh, but my people are from the, the Kaipara Harbour, Te Urea Hau, Ngāti Whātua, and also from the Hukianga Harbour, um, Te Kai Tūtai, Te Waiariki, uh, Te Rarua, and of course, being up here, we're all part of Ngāpuhi Nui Tonu. Um, very, very pleased to be a part of listening to what people's perspectives are and I'd like to take a leaf out of um, some of Emily's talk and uh, also Jeremy's talk today um, just to briefly introduce uh, what we're doing in, in Toing Apuhi. We've only really just started uh, in earnest as Toing Apuhi uh, but all of us and we're, we're a small board um, myself and um, uh, Co-chair uh, Moe Mill from Ngāti Hine and Ngāpuhi, uh, also uh, Ro Hoskins, um, Dorothy Waitford, uh, Kuru, Kura Te Waru Rewiri. Uh, we're the board at the moment trying to come real and uh, of course we have our uh, Pau Takawainga, Gail Richards, uh, who has a, a lot of experience in arts administration and also the performing arts. Uh, with Te Kanikani Kani Ate Rangatahi. Um, 
So we've just begun, and I suppose uh, we're seeking to be uh, or create a, a, uh, an atmosphere of agency for our people, our creatives at home in Te Tokiro. And sometimes we get a little bit cut off from the rest of the country. Um, and, you know, we're quite often, everything north of Auckland is Ngāpuhi. Uh, and of course, we have our own distinct communities and histories uh, dialects ourselves and um, uh, this is a chance for us to uh, create some solidarity amongst ourselves at Tautukero and, and uh, look at where uh, agency can um, increase that kind of expression of who we are, uh, where we've come from, where we're headed. Um, I suppose also similar to Jeremy, uh, we have uh, an advocacy role and uh, one of the first things uh, that came to the fore in, in the work that we did as a group of creatives really that recognized the need is we approached um, the, the Ngāpuhi Runanga to say, um, actually there's some issues around, you know, like uh, appropriation and uh, appropriation over this lockdown has actually come to the fore with um, people's images being appropriated uh, people's uh, creativity um, in, in the form of um, uh, paintings and, and graphic design being appropriated and then used for sale. And of course, we all realize that um, the last six weeks has uh, created pressure uh, and I suppose has uh, seen the loss of a lot of usual or what have become usual types of revenue. So we've got to think laterally, but you know, that's when uh, people are pushed to thinking laterally that the issues of appropriation actually come into a sharp focus. So as creatives, we knew that that was the case and some of our uh, uh, tribal authorities, when they're faced with all of the weight of the social kinds of statistics that we we're always reminded about in the media, uh, creativity and expression gets kind of put to the side. So as creatives, we wanted to take that lead and actually lead from the front. So we're not, not part of our iwi um, or tribal authority structure. We're not part of a, a learning structure. We've decided to establish ourselves as a charitable company and work across all of the iwi structures in, uh, in Te Tai Tukero, uh, so that we can collectively uh, help to advocate for our communities and look to some sort of agency. Uh, within them. Um, we have five mainstreams. Mana Whakahaere, we, we see that as being artist-led. Uh, we're not, um, uh, although we have uh, a lot of administration su uh, support and uh, experience amongst our um, board team and with Gail, um, we see ourselves as being uh, primarily creatives. We're creatives leading the advocacy and the agency for our creative communities in Te Tukero. We also have realized that um, artistic excellence is something that we as creatives, we aim for. And sometimes um, those who are not creatives uh, have a, a quite a wide differing uh, opinion about um, artistic quality and um, artistic ability. Uh, we also have an important um, role to look at cultural excellence. So that means if there are uh, Taitukero or Ngāpuhi Nuitonu narratives, or even uh, down to the definitive narratives of our hapu and their own little uh, valleys, like my valley where I live at the moment, uh, it's up to those people uh, to determine their mana motuhake. And so cultural excellence is based upon a three-dimensional perspective of uh, our uh, identity as tangata whenua in our locations and how we relate to those of our people who have become uh, dislocated and disconnected from uh, these locations. Now, don't have any answers, but we realize that that is uh, an important thing to focus on. Uh, environmental excellence, you know, so a lot of our um, traditional uh, artistic activities, our cultural expressions, uh, come from the environment, you know, so we know that um, the kinds of um, carving timber, the types of um, fibers and uh, the, the dyes that are made from kōkowai and pukepoto, we know that those deposits are either um, uh, 
diminishing. Uh, their Modi is diminishing uh, absolutely, and our access to uh, those places uh, is changing. So that um, sometimes we go to the environment to get the resources, we forget that there are people who are vitally connected to connected to those places. They care for the Modi uh, in a variety of different ways, and so there's a person connection as well as a material connection. So our environmental uh, um, excellence stream is really important. And then um, uh, education excellence is also something. You know, sometimes uh, as, as a, a tribal creative, a person who lives at home is part of my, my own marae, I'm involved with my hapu activities from Kaipara through to Hukianga. I know that um, education uh, falls way short. You know, it, it usually um, provides education aspects to our children to say that Maori stuff looks like this. And so that um, a, a simple example of that is our dialects. You know, for the rest of the country, the native wood pigeon is a kiridu, but for us in Tatukaro, the, the name of that beautiful bird is a kukupa. But if our children are being taught that that animal is known as the wood pigeon or the kiridu, it kind of makes us feel invisible. Kind of been watching some interesting um, uh, videos from from the Northern Hemisphere, the Faroe Islands. So Faroese is, uh, is kind of like a dialect of uh, Taitukero in many respects. Uh, the world says, well, wow, there's only a few people that actually speak like that. So uh, it's not really that important. We should just lump you all into this, this big group. Um, it's the, the role of Toing Apuhi to say, well, actually, uh, the way we use language is a vital way of how we see ourselves and how we uh, determine an expression of ourselves. That's a big, that's a big blah. And we've just begun, and we had hoped to uh, begin with a, a number of activities uh, starting in May, June, July this year, uh, with um, the launch of our website, um, which is being crafted by uh, Kyra Clark, uh, a Ngapuhi um, Taitukero native creative. And also Tauda Eruwera uh, with his experience in, um, in IT, uh, straight into level four. And so our website has been um, crafted in the last five weeks by Zoom, uh, or Zui is, uh, is becoming the um, vernacular. Zui and Zanang are, are taking over. Uh, so we've managed to push out um, the time frame a little, but actually, uh, I think that, uh, like Jeremy, I, I'm, I see the glass half full most of the time. And actually, our, our website is going to be far richer than had uh, Level 4 not forced us to think more laterally about them, some things. Another activity that we were planning to do was a summit uh, to try and put on the radar screen for some of our own leaders and our own communities some of the tenets of um, quality and expression and the role of culture and language uh, in the form of a summit. Uh, people that are recognized by their reputation, their bodies of work to come together and talk about their experiences and then to begin to put some stakes in the ground that we can check out every two, three, uh, maybe five years as a summit rolls around and we can just have a, a longitudinal study, I suppose, as we go along. Well, of course, Level four happened. So we've had to think uh, creatively about that. And in, in fact, um, the thinking about a summit we'd called a taumata, um, the, where our eyes come to rest, you know, the, the, the summit of the, um, uh, the, the peak of a hill. And so what we thought was actually, we can do things on a web-based platform, just like um, uh, what this uh, pans uh, hui on air is like. Uh, so that means that, uh, you know, we're, we're tribal people, you know, when we express ourselves, we need to have that expressed within a community. And so uh, we're going to look at uh, the online platform being a, a taumata kōrero, like this. Uh, it's going to be slightly different. We'll focus on the same themes. Uh, but then uh, in about a year's time, we're going to hold a gathering uh, with the, um, you know, all things being equal and we can come back together again in hui. Uh, we'll call that the Hui Taumata. And so we'll use two platforms to put these stakes in the ground and keep constantly checking out with our people um, how 
how that seems to be going, how our advocacy for them is working and how the work in building agency amongst themselves and their mana motuhake um, begins to roll out. Anyway, that's um, uh, about where we started. Uh, um, I'd like to just finish my introduction to say um, uh, it's really important to uh, understand that the world is different. You know, we've just got to take that into some consideration. And as tribal people, we've, we've actually got to take the responsibility, the obligation to look at how we express our culture now. You know, so I have seen on um, this platform people doing hungi with one another like this. You know, that's one variation. Uh, sometimes it's called, you know, the East Coast eyebrow wave. But, um, you know, we really have to think about how we express ourselves uh, from this point going forward. Um, how, we, um, how we reflect that and the important things, how our ancestors did, ngā kōrero onamata, how we do things in this time, given all of the challenges we've got, ngā kōrero inamata, and how we set the platform for expressing ourselves in the future, ngā kōrero anamata. Hoinano uh, kanu i tēnei māku, tēnā hoki koutou katoa. Kia ora, Bernard. E mihi ana ki a koe mō tō kōrero. Thank you so much for everything you shared there. So many important points. Um, I was really struck by what you're just saying there at the end around how are we going to move forward to express ourselves in a new way? What's our new way in this new world? And listening to many of the values and um, I guess goals and objectives that you have and your board have set within the Toing Apuhi, um, I feel to me like many of the things that we've all been stopping to reflect on during the time of Alert Level 4, those ideas of what are our relationship to Te Taiao, to the environment, what is our relationship to our cultural heritage um, and modes of expression, uh, whether we've grown up in the city or, or grown up in our tribal areas, um, and the idea of sovereignty of, of mana motuhake for ourselves as artists, and, and I'm speaking about Māori and Pākehā as well. Um, another issue that you raised I thought was really important was the idea of appropriation, and perhaps now at this time um, where it, these things are coming to the fore, that maybe they wouldn't happen if we if we talked, if we found ways to talk about those issues more regularly. Um, but perhaps that's a conversation for another day. I just had a comment come through on the Facebook as well. Um, Bernard just saying, I tika te kōrero e pana ki te kauri die back, me ngā tangata o te ao, just your connection between the kauri die back um, pandemic and our own pandemic that we're suffering now as well is another connection. I'd like to ask a question of all the panelists now, just with regards to all of you sound like you've had you've got amazing initiatives that were go, that were going before COVID nineteen. What for you for your organisations or your own arts practice is maybe now the most important one that's risen to the surface for you that has risen to the surface um, for you and coming out of this this time. What's the most important or maybe the first thing that you'll be hoping to achieve or work on? I'll start with you, Emily. Uh, the most, I, I don't know if I can place one most important thing. I I think this really, this time is going to be a game changer in terms of uh, the need for direct regional funding. Um, if there was a sort of glass half full view of what has happened, I think it has highlighted the, the need to um, increase and, fo and focus regional funding. Um, I mean, we need, need security going forwards. And um, I should mention, you know, we have managed to keep some of our work uh, happening over Zoom. For example, the Otipoti Writers Lab sessions we have been uh, holding um, over Zoom uh, twice a month. So we've continued some of that. Uh, yeah, so would really like to see far more investment regionally. Um, That's a good call. Work. That's a really good call. Thanks, Emily. Again, it's just really highlighted the fragility um, for some communities who have been going through a myriad of different changes in their environments already. And like you were saying earlier, with, with things that have arisen out of the closure of the fortune, um, yeah, more investment and funding and support 
would I guess enable you to feel more secure at this time and really grip onto projects that you're working on. Jeremy, I'll come to you now for a question about what would be the first thing perhaps that would come out of, for you, come out of this time? Um, well, I'd like to um, support what Emily said. Um, certainly sustainable funding in the regions is a really key thing um, because I think what that ties into is if we've, the government's got this um, support for the four well-beings and um, cultural well-being as a kind of service for our community um, if you think about it with a service lens, is that if, if there is sustainable funding for those arts organisations who are providing that, then we have the ability to make arts activity, um, arts experiences accessible to a wider um, group of the community because it's less reliant on ticket sales to put on productions or things like that. Um, and so for us, one of the key, th we've been kind of moving towards a deeper understanding of the connection between arts and well-being and how to kind of measure that and articulate that to our councils and funders. And so this has really highlighted the need for that in partnership with that sustainable funding to to know that when we consider well-being, we, we're kind of thinking about cultural well-being as encompassing values, shared beliefs, customs, behaviours, identity, the, the kind of things that help shape and define who, who we are as New Zealanders and our sense of space and place as individuals as well as communities. And I think that that's going to be really key um, in terms of a broader understanding of the value of art in our communities and why it is so essential. I mean, we talk about essential services now, and I think that art and creativity and culture is essential. It, it may be differently essential to um, food and, and health services, but I think it fulfills some of those same needs in us. And it, it's going to be one of those things that really helps to bring communities together, which is going to be beneficial for our mental health and our overall well-being. Kilda, thank you, Jeremy. I agree that arts is essential um, across many spaces and many of our artists as well are also not necessarily just working in the space of professional theatre or writing, but actually involved in community activities as well. Bernard, I'll come back to you with a question of for toying apuhi or even for you with your own arts practice, what's going to be the, what's the most important thing that's, or the thing that's going to happen next for you coming out of this time? Yeah. I think, of course, funding, resourcing is a big issue. Uh, but I'm going to go to our, our vision. Te whakaoho te hihi mo te kaunga o ngā tikanga me ngā auahatanga o ngā puhi putanua i te tautokera. Inspiring excellence in ngā puhi cultural and, ex and creative expression across the tautokera. So I think one of the key things, um, and, and this is without my uh, chance to fully uh, test this with the board. So this is Bernard speaking as Bernard the artist more than Bernard uh, um, the chair of Toing Apuhi is this is a chance for a reset. Uh, we, we've known in Te Tukero that uh, a key part of our uh, earning uh, capacity in Te Tukero is tourism. We also know that apart from um, uh, the very few operators who are Ngāpuhi or Ngāpuhi Nui Tonu, um, there are also operators that tend to take a, a minimal um, perspective of our presentation of our culture. Definitely our culture as opposed to, uh, is presented uh, by makers of um, souvenirs as opposed to creatives. That probably uh, cats amongst the, amongst the pigeons, but uh, it's a chance to reset. If people are coming here because of the uh, cultural aspect of tourism, then let's give them um, not everything, but let's give them at least a better deal than what they're getting now with rows of um, machine produced carvings and um, kite that are made overseas by um, um, not so. Uh, eco-friendly materials and that sort of thing. Let's look at resetting, uh, advocate for um, how we might address those uh, issues from a creative point of view and definitely a cultural point of view and uh, use this time to reset. 
uh, also think that we have a um, opportunity uh, that's given a different focus now, more of a focus, a highlight to look at uh, education and particularly providing opportunities to our rangatahi taiohi, uh, matatahi. Um, how do we focus on that? And I'm also conscious that uh, we brought on our second uh, uh, worker into Toing Apuhi uh, on the first week of level four. So we have Bethany Matai Edmonds, um, uh, and we had her induction by Zui. Uh, we've um, had our catch ups, and her uh, responsibility is to look at how we deliver to Rangatahi. So that's a great opportunity uh, to be thrown right in amongst the challenges of what we'd previously thought for the last couple of years, what that might look like. And within a space of a week, that is really turned around and turned on its head. But it's a great opportunity to reset, reset and look at um, uh, reviewing our key things. Um, of course, resourcing, we've got to look to resource that however we can, but our pers perspective, if we keep the uh, quality and the, the um, uh, perspectives of uh, integrity, uh, that's mana motuhake, if we keep that high and then we look at how we uh, create that for ourselves, that's mana, uh, mana motuhake in partnership with Tino Rangatiratanga, then that's a winning combination. And then we have to figure out how we resource it. Um, but that, that's how I'd answer that question, uh, Delina. Thanks. Uh, and of course, agreeing with Emily and Jeremy as well. Kia ora, Bernard. Thank you. And congratulations to Bethany Edmonds yeah. on her new role with Toing Apuhi. Kia ora, Bethany. Thank you. I've had a question that's come in here from our, our um, participants who are joining us this morning on Facebook Live and YouTube. Uh, this is a question about with many organizations who seem to be taking meetings online and which is great in this age of the digital technology have you in your particular different regions come across connectivity issues do you know if all of your artists have got access to reception and internet connection or have, have you had to overcome anything with regards to connectivity which in the cities it's we don't have those same issues Jeremy, maybe I'll come to you first on this one. Yeah, um, certainly there is a little bit of, of that. Um, as we kind of move out into the region, the internet connectivity gets a little bit more patchy. Um, and one of the ways that we've kind of moved around that is even things that are live, we will also have them recorded and available online so people can kind of watch them after the fact. And, and while you may not get as much of the... Um, practical um, interaction with the way that things work on social media, you can still put a comment up at any time. And, and we've got our team looking at those and kind of answering those as they come in and when they come in. So it may be that the live things don't work for people in terms of connectivity or just in terms of what they have to do with their whanau, um, with, with people teaching their, their kids and, and, and other work responsibilities and things. Not everyone can tune in at 11 o'clock on a Monday or 9 o'clock on a Wednesday or whatever. And so the fact that you can kind of go back to them afterwards, I think, has has been useful. Um, but, yeah, the, it is a, um, an issue. And I, I think that our internet, uh, the ability to work online is so much better now than it was even two years ago. And, it, and I think it continues to improve. And it has been a remarkable thing about this time now is that we can, for the most part, manage to have some form of connection. Um, but in terms of those kind of broader um, connectivity issues, I think there's some scope for what that could become in terms of maybe some delivery um, delivery packs, some um, offline ways to connect that are, are done through the post system. So maybe it's the creation of some of those resources and then they're, they're packaged up and posted or, or something like that. I mean, we're working with a couple of groups who have communities who um, aren't all, all online. And so that um, is an issue. And the other thing is um, when we think about some of the community choirs and they have um, older members of our community who may not be as active online, what that means for them um, over the past little while when they couldn't get together and sing and, and that experience of that collective kind of voice um, 
and I assume the same thing for for kapahaka and for orchestras and for other group things. It's it, it's really hard to do that even online because the way that the voice things work in Zoom is that they cut you off if someone else is speaking. So it's hard to hard to be together um, even through some of that. Kia ora, thank you. There was just a note come through that the forty eight hour film festival apparently struggled with. Um, some major connectivity issues. And also we know that with some of our hui and online events, there's lots of spam out there as well, which is, which is another issue to deal with. Emily, how have you been keeping in touch with your wider group of artists with the Theatre Lab? I, I don't know that we have such a connectivity issue uh, in Dunedin being a giga city, um, but what I would, like to comment on is how it's changed the dynamics of how we work. I mentioned earlier that we've continued the Otipoti Writers Lab sessions. So those were um, three hour free sessions for anyone. They were open, although we would cap it at 20 participants and we held them in the uh, Dunedin Fringe headquarters in the centre of town. And that was a really important space for people, um, especially those who may not have a working space at home or they have the pressures of, you know, just family stuff or other commitments that you have. And so just being able to carve out some time to write was really um, important to them. Also, you know, to sit around a large table with coffee and biscuits and to peel off into smaller groups so writers who might be working on uh, similar projects. So we've had to adapt or model, um, modify that model a bit. So we've shortened the amount of time and we've kept the number of participants to 10 people. So while we've continued with the writers uh, lab, we are also very aware that we can't deliver it in the same way as we have previously. I'm constantly fascinated by all the different stories I hear about different ways that artists and people with groups have been adapting to create things online. I came from a, um, I attended last week a little showing that came from a six week online dance process, which was kind of kind of a fan, another fantastic way to be working together. Bernard, I'll come to you up north. How's your connectivity issues in your region? Uh, it's shocking. Uh, connectivity is, re you know, this is one thing that has really come to the fore in this um, this last period, this last six weeks, that the connectivity to our communities um, is really poor. And I, if Jeremy, one of the things that we've looked at is that uh, uh, an opportunity to have a web-based uh, platform is the ability to record and then to access at, at a later time, uh, perhaps at a, at a different location. Um, so that's a, that we see that as a plus. Uh, so more of our activities, I think in the future going forward will be recorded and um, we'll seek to deliver those or at least make those accessible uh, for people in their time and their, um, and their own way. Uh, look going forward but connectivity um, should be something that's addressed and I, I know that um, uh, during uh, the last four or five weeks the um, the discussions have been happening in our, our remote communities. I've got to say that that's a really important thing because many of our remote communities people don't just choose to live there because it's a remote place you know it's it's the place in the world that makes sense to them it's where their ancestors uh, uh, lived, it's where their grandparents uh, lived and died, and so um, uh, connectivity makes it much more relevant and uh, valid for people to exist in those places. So we've got to find a way for those things to be um, made made easier, and then we, you know because a lot of those rural places is where the real depth of our um, heritage. Um, springs from. So if we can begin to uh, forge relationships with the people who live in those places in different ways, then um, that's got to be a good thing. You know, surely it's, it's, why, uh, it's why 
they when when hapu get together and they meet at a marae and they have the welcome it, that's why it's so electric and visceral that uh, you know the those two identities coming together formally and engaging with one, one another creates a new energy you know we've got to figure out how to do that so one of the challenges we've got and this is again this is just bernard speaking uh, not necessarily a, uh, I suppose that's a disclaimer, isn't it? You know, it's not necessarily the, the views of Tui Ngāpuhi. But, you know, it's it's how I think as a, as a Tui Ngāpuhi creative is that um, you know, part of the element of being tribal people is the role of kawa, understanding that we don't just get together and make it up, you know. We have some formality, we have some... Um, we have some performance to the way we um, interact with one another. So it's it's cool to use terms like zānanga and zui, uh, but just giving a, um, a platform a cool name doesn't actually fully uh, work out the protocols um, that we, um, that might be the best thing for our culture going forward. Now, one of the things that we're really familiar with is that generally something is formed and then we have to try and wrap our culture around it. You know, architecture is a good example. How do we, how do we live our extended family lives in a minimalist um, two-bedroom house with a galley kitchen? Yeah. Anybody that's eaten in an extended family knows that uh, we've got to have a big kitchen and usually that's why people cook outside. You know, some of those fundamental things We've got to redesign, and the the protocols of how we use these platforms, um, it will actually begin to form something uh, that people will be able to appreciate, and uh, perhaps even begin to adapt and adopt uh, as ways of um, performing with this technology going forward. The last thing I say is it's an opportunity, and you know, this is glass half full again. Um, so there are some things on this platform that are challenges that don't actually work for us. So if there's some um, really good IT people around, and if uh, if they are, we hope to find them in Ngāpuhi, uh, that we maybe create our own platform. You know, that's Manamotu Hake and Tino Rangatiratanga again. I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying that as a, a hopeful uh, way going forward, but it uh, seems like an opportunity to me. Yeah, that's awesome. The opportunities are endless. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about um, the protocols around, say, a hui, which then is, becomes a Zoom hui or a zui, and how that's not really a hui. <laughs> or a wānanga, which becomes a Zoom wānanga or a zānanga. But how, how do we continue to practice Evolve. it? Um, yeah, it's, that's, the, that's the evolution of culture, I see. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a very interesting time moving forward. Um, I wanted to pick up on your point, Bernard, about um, people going home or, or, you know, living in the place which makes sense to them. And just before the lockdown, a lot of artists went back to their hometowns yeah. or maybe based there. I saw new people going home to Tikawiti or to Wellington or wherever they were from to support their parents or be with their family across the lockdown period. And potentially might, for a longer period, stay in their hometowns. And we've had a lot of conversation around the local economies and buying local, being local, and perhaps we're going to continue to have more artists back in their own communities that they've grown up in, um, which I think is an exciting opportunity. But another question that's come through is when we do, we've had a lot of focus on arts practice, but when we, how are we going to reconnect with our audiences when we are ready to go back out and to be presenting theatre shows or concerts or exhibitions? Does, I'd like to ask each of the panelists for your thoughts about audiences around this time and how we might reconnect with them. I'll start with you, Emily. Well, I mean, this was a issue before the lockdown um, in Dunedin with the lack of, you know, both soft and hard infrastructure. It is, um, it is a challenge to keep uh, engaging your audience in a sustainable way. So going forwards, again, this has really been brought into focus, the, the need for investment um, in funding in this area so that our audience, and I don't just like to use the term audience, but community um, feel that this is work that is created for them. Then not just pop up events that, you know, happen all over the show, that the onus is on them to follow them 
around and patronise, but um, this is for the community wellbeing that they have um, an investment in. Thanks, Emily. That's a great point. Jeremy. Yeah, definitely. Um, the the process of um, audience development is is an issue was an issue prior to this situation and and will be going forward. Um, I think for venues and arts organisations and, and groups and artists um, demonstrating a, a duty of care for audiences around their safety and, and their comfort levels coming back into um, live experiences. And that may be a kind of change in the way that we work in terms of what the audience sizes are or how they are spaced in a, in a venue um, whichever venues are are being utilised, um, but yeah, it's a it's an ongoing um, area of kind of interest and in, and in development for us is is how do we get more of the local community to go and see those local stories because they're telling the stories that are of that space and of that time and of those people, and I mean we've there's a really thriving arts scene in the Waikato, but a lot of people even from the Waikato may not be aware that it exists. Um, it, it, it's interesting that over the last year, I'd been talking to some people who were saying, oh, there's just so much great activity on. Um, we, we've got, there's too much on. And I said, well, I don't think that's probably the case. I think what the problem is, is that it's the same 500 people who go to every event and they can't be in two places at once. So we don't have that kind of, continual growing of, of an audience who want to experience local um, work and, and maybe that's just that they don't know that it's on or they don't know where to find it and so I'm hoping that there's some potential in this kind of shift towards supporting local and buying local and experiencing local is that we're going to see more of a kind of turn inward to the work that's happening in our communities and and a real embracing of what that is and that is of course paired with needs for funding and, and the way that infrastructure works and, and all of these other things, but this kind of cultural shift in towards knowing the really outstanding quality of work that's made locally. I mean, in the Waikato, but across New Zealand, there is just some phenomenal work that's being made by our artists. And hopefully this is a time for them to be showcased, to be profiled. I mean, how amazing would it be to have a, a nightly arts segment on the, the news and, and, and the media kind of profiling this work in a really meaningful way to introduce it to new communities who may not have had the opportunity to experience it because they may not be connected directly to what's going on. Thanks, Jeremy. Some more great points there. Thank you. Bernard, coming up to you. With Emily. Uh, and the perspective of community. Um, we, we, uh, when we started doing the interactions with our communities uh, over 10 years ago and uh, in a series of consultations and um, hui to discuss what a toing apuhi might look like, uh, it became really clear that um, our modern existence in 2020, uh, we, have, we have a valid choice. We have a, and the choices between art and toy, and sometimes art and toy gets used uh, interchangeably. But it seems to me that art um, is a, a, a personal choice, a personal expression, uh, understanding the world around you and then expressing it. And if you happen to be in a, a place like my village in my um, uh, valley, then my world is around me so it's going to be expressing what I I think is uh, worth expressing or is important to express and toy has a community attached to it so that it's not just the person expressing their own um, perspectives and definitions it's definitions which are uh, vitally linked to extended family and, and kin so actually one of the and that is that toy uh, within a kinship group is about living life you know so we should be looking at our communities to how do we live our lives now and one of the things in the last five 
weeks has suggested that perhaps we should be gardening more. Perhaps we should be um, understanding how we collect uh, shellfish and fish and, um, and hunt, you know, that we don't just go to a place, collect the, um, the food and go, you know, actually the Māori of those places is important and so are the people who are connected vitally to those locations. So, you know, we've got a, a chance to look at uh, a whole range of different things, which then makes my head hurt as the chair of Tuing Apuhi being only a small board that has only just started because the scope is so large. And we've got to try and um, encourage our creatives to keep being creative, to keep pushing to, to do better and to express themselves and to inspire other people to express themselves. But we also have got an opportunity to look at how are our communities expressing themselves uh, and this time based upon what I said before about una mata, ina mata and ana mata. Kia ora, thank you Bernard. There's been just a comment that came through in response to what you said earlier Jeremy about um, just reminding us that the cost of attending events is a major factor in growing audiences that there might be quite a number of people in the Waikato who know about what's going on but either can't afford to buy tickets or to travel to the event. And I think that's probably as part of this whole reset, something that arts organizations will be thinking about coming out of this, coming out of the COVID-19 lockdown. We know we're going to be coming into um, a period of depression, as they say, or and, and that these ideas around accessibility to the arts will be something that we'll all be thinking about. I wanted to now just ask each of you, as we're so lucky to have a panel, a panel full of artists from different genres to just ask you about what you've been working on in your own arts practice during this lockdown. Uh, and I'll start with you, Bernard. Unmute, okay, thanks, Delina. Um, well, it's interesting. Um, I, I, so my main um, sort of artistry is carving and drawing, design. Um, so I've actually found the isolation really it's kind of like i'm spoiled um because normally you know when leading a, a cultural life you know got the marae got church you've got uh, community things there's always an important committee meeting to go to because of some of uh, the community activities and initiatives uh, but being able to be at home for the last five weeks has been a real opportunity to um I found that actually I've slowed right down and I'm instead of rushing to get jobs done, can actually spend the time that I really like. I was up last night at one o'clock in the morning. My daughter was uh, with me and she fell asleep. But it was it was really, I was never do that normally because after a day's work, you're usually so exhausted. So um, yeah, that's been a, an interesting thing. And I, I've got to say that as a, you know, tribal person, and a creative trying to, to make ends meet. Um, my family takes a hit quite a lot because I have to be stuck in my little corner here is my carving corner. And uh, if I need to focus, you know, carving like all artistry is not something you just turn on like a tap and then turn off again and turn back on. You know, you've got to really get yourself in the zone. So the isolation has helped with that. Um, but in looking forward, as far as um, uh, Toing Apuhi is concerned, um, the the real issues around connectivity is is a real challenge. I want to get my real my teeth really stuck into that, so that we can um, encourage that isolation and focus on your work to get things done is great. And then when it's done, let's share it. Let's have ways of of sharing it uh, and having uh, the audience, if you like. Um, not sure if I'm comfortable with that word, but at least people who can interact with your work. You know, that's the other thing about um, the kind of creativity that we're talking about. Uh, a carving is nothing without the people to experience it and for the stories to be shared, the expressions to be um, brought to life amongst people. You know, carving comes to life when those interactions take place. What does that mean? How does that relate to what we're doing now? Where was that wood from? You know, that, that's when when our artistry, um, in in my perspective, uh, really comes to life. I'm keen to hear what uh, what Jeremy and Emily have got to say. Yeah, thanks, Bernard. We'll come to you now, Jeremy. 
Um, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting time. Um, I've been working on finishing off a, bu a bunch of studio projects, um, an album of um, music written with my musical brother and longtime collaborator, Horo Bono Horo. So we're um, bringing, bringing that to um, its, its final stages, which is great. Um, and starting a work on a concerto for Tonga Poro and orchestra, um, which will hopefully be premiered later this year, depending on how things go. Um, but it's also been a time to make some fun electro pop music with my wife, who's a musical theatre performer, so it's something a bit different for her, and also working on a, a, an album with my son. So he released his first album last year, He's when he was seven, it was called Seven. Now he's eight, so we're working on eight. So we've, we've done five songs of, of eight songs there, and, and I feel really fortunate to be in a position where we have uh, the ability to do that um, from home in this time. So that's been really rewarding to be part of that. Um, and, and before I finish, I just wanted to um, speak to that to that comment. Certainly the, the cost of attending events is a, is a huge factor, and that's part of what I talked about earlier in terms of that sustainable funding for our arts groups. Um, if we're thinking about those um, arts activities as being kind of key services for the well-being, they, they've got to be supported because um, that's how we get our communities to attend them. And I know looking at some of the theatre works that have been in the, in the Waikato, um, in the late 90s, tickets to the theatre were $15 and last um, last month, the tickets to the theatre were fifteen dollars, and um, inflation hasn't kind of come through on those things. But the cost of running those events has also gone up. So it's that that mix of how we make it sustainable for the artists and and accessible for the communities, and that's a, a really kind of key thing to develop as we move forward. Got it, Jeremy. Thank you for those thoughts. And boy, you do not sound like you're short on things to do with your arts practice. Keep busy. Emily, we'll come to you now. What have you been focusing on in your arts practice? Well, I've taken a real uh, shift um, with one of my own personal projects. I think so often how you know we have to work in the arts is we're quite we have to be output focused for you know purposes of doing funding applications. What is the end product going to be, um, so to speak? And I've really carved out some time to, um, alongside other things, write a story just long hand. Um, I've purposely been using all those pieces of paper I've wanted to recycle and just follow the story for a period of time each day and write it. And I've, I've enjoyed that process of discovery again. It's, um, I found that really uh, refreshing, having less literal noise around it's wonderful having you know the bird song but also being able to turn down a bit of the noise um in your head because you know there is only so much we can plan at the moment so yeah that's great emily i love to hear that you've been exploring process in your time in the lockdown that's fantastic now, I think our time's coming to an end. We haven't got any more questions coming through at the moment, but I wondered if I might just come to you all for a closing thought before we finish our panel today. And I'll maybe I'll start in the middle with you, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I think um, for for us, um, our, our kind of closing thought is, is our vision for a community that prospers with diverse and transformative creative activity. Um, and we, are looking to work with artists and arts organizations um, to have the knowledge that our, our cultural heritage, our cultural creativity in its multiple forms from memories and landscapes are celebrated and are um, valued and are resourced. And so we are looking for this as, as something that's alive and constantly evolving and we have an opportunity now to um, take the time to to kind of reimagine what our creative world becomes and um, use our voices to talk to those um, in, in, in leadership to help them fully understand that as well. 
in a way that benefits the the entirety of our community and our, our collective well-being. Kilda, thank you. Emily, what's your closing thought you'd like to share with us? Yeah, probably um, very similar to what Jeremy has said. Um, you know, the, the theme of this who he was, who he has been, um, the regional focus. I would encourage people to maybe rethink what regional means to them. It's not just some outpost that doesn't concern the rest of the country. If we take a holistic or diverse view of Aotearoa New Zealand, um, we really do need to invest in the regions and all the diverse voices and communities. Um, yeah, so please let's all focus on that going forwards for the well-being of all. Thank you, Emily. Bernard. Yeah, thanks. Been been awesome to be part of this, and uh, I like to um, take a, an opportunity to thank uh, Emily and and Otiputi and also many and and um, Waikato. Um, I suppose some um, kind of comment to conclude from my point of view is that um, uh, it's obvious that we uh, in Toingapuhi need to be aware of um, the breadth of the land uh, in this last five weeks. Um, that's an emphasis that uh, we we have an um, environmental excellence um, strand to our our vision and our uh, emphasis of our work and, and that's going to come to the fore, I think. Uh, if we look back uh, in a way of um, uh, trying to discern and determine a way forward, um, the environment has been what our ancestors drew upon for the inspiration. Um, I'm sure that um, it can be an inspiration for us. We know that there are elements of our um, our environment that are in need of um, te whakahau manu and te whakahau ngā here here. And uh, perhaps I'm concentrating on that, not so much about expressing that, but how to um, look at our environments, that'll, that'll also create a, a greater motive for ourselves and then we can begin to express that. Um, I'm, also go, I've got to do the plug, Delina, got to do the plug. And the plug is uh, to say that uh, we'll have a, a website very soon. It's um, uh, going to be an experience that we hope is very interactive. It's not just a website that you go and click into a couple of places and look at, at cool pictures. We're um, going to have an interactive website and engagement with our communities and with other regions and, uh, and their communities. And also, um, uh, look at uh, within the uh, next eight weeks or so, uh, our first platform of an online hui similar to this, but uh, as our Taumata Kōrero uh, series uh, kicks off an uh, inaugural um, beginning to the um, the summit and Taumata series that we'll be running from now on. Wainano tēne ka mihi atu ki au koutou makatoa. I've just had a comment come through that says thanks to all of the Xanalysts <laughs> on the Zui this morning. And yes, I do want to um, thank you so much to everybody out there for joining us and also a huge thank you to our panellists, Emily, Jeremy and Bernard. It's been wonderful to speak to you all this morning. Um, I want to thank you for being, for who you are as artists and also thank you for your advocacy um, for creative agency for the artists in your areas. I've really taken away lots today, especially hearing the call for investment and funding for the regions, hearing the call to think about the regions as part of the diverse voice of all of Aotearoa and not an outpost, um, and for local communities to be connecting with local artists that we're going to have a reset. It's a time to reimagine new futures. And that toy is embedded in the way that we live our lives. So a huge, huge thank you to you three for joining us all this morning. Pans in Auckland Live will be continuing with our online Zui Hui series uh, with the next one happening next Monday, the 18th of May at 11am. Hope to see you all there. 
Um, also, I want to just take this opportunity to thank the Big Idea, who have been a media partner with us supporting our online hui, and they will have a follow-up article on the Big Idea website, um, just summing up ideas from this panel this morning. So again, a huge thank you to you all. I'll close our session with the karakia. Whakamutanga. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, kia tere te kairohirohi i mua i tō huarahi. Have a wonderful day. Please stay, stay safe and well out there. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.